<clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. Um, glad you were here. We're just getting the screen share up. And um, we are in part six, as you can see. And um, tonight we will actually get to our first set of battles. So again, for those of you who maybe are just joining us or or just um, you know seeing along with me as I'm getting things set up here, um, we we've been spending time for the first four sessions looking at the background that that leads us to this map here, and and then last week we talked about what happened after Lincoln's election and those first furious three, four months between the election in November when President Buchanan was still the president. It's one of the things many people kind of don't pay attention to. We all know we vote in November, but the president's not technically the president to the next year. I'm always guilty of putting the years for the president in the even numbers, right? So 2000 to 2004, when technically, technically, you know, it's the odd numbers. Uh, of when the actual term of the president, I, I, I just tell my students, just some old work with me. Um, and we just stay with the even numbers. It's, it's more, it's simpler for me. Um, but I, you also probably know that there have been a few moments in time when that window of time between a president being at the end of his term and before the next president takes office, it's called the lame duck part. It's the time when usually, historically, most presidents they don't do a lot. Um, they don't try to start a war. They don't sign off on any major legislation. It's just sort of like, we'll go through the holidays, relax, come out on the other side. And this is one of the few, in fact, maybe the only moment in which something significant happened in that intervening moment, that middle period. And of course, South Carolina votes to secede, as we saw in mid-December. They start threatening all the forts. Fort Sumter gets into the, obviously, in the mix, as we saw. And so President Buchanan is the president, not President Lincoln. And um, he doesn't do a lot, understandably. Um, so we watched that happen. And then we saw with President Lincoln's inauguration, kind of like what happened that kind of led. And, and you remember, there's really two phases, perhaps we could argue three phases of secession. There's South Carolina and their initial call to everybody to come with us, form a new country. And um, the lower south does including texas but the upper south you know those there's eight states there they all vote against it and we saw last time that except for south carolina there was no unanimous vote although i would say in states like mississippi and louisiana it was pretty pretty consistently you, you know largely unanimous so as you go through that then we saw the showdown with with fort sumter is what really threw in the con contention what would happen next and that's the moment when for myself from a strategic point of view lincoln made a tactical error i um, mean it's an error i think he learned from in that he didn't reach out to the virginia's governor and just say hey look stay out of it stay neutral you voted it down the state's kind of divided don't do anything and we won't bother you we won't march on your on your land we won't ask for any troops I mean, there's reasons why you wouldn't do that, but in any case, when Kentucky, as we'll see in a second, pledges themselves neutral, Lincoln goes, yes, great, cool. And it was the Confederacy who broke the neutrality of Kentucky and invaded Kentucky in late 61. And so, you know, then Lincoln put troops in. Um, my ancestor, who was living in East Tennessee, where my family has lived since the 1820s and 30s, as I'll tell you more in a moment, um, joined the Union Army, and you know, basic training camp basically was in Western Kentucky. And so Lincoln was able to do that kind of a neutral stance with Kentucky. I think he could have done it with Virginia. He didn't though, he asked for an army, he asked for it from every loyal state, and that's what threw the upper states into another round of voting. So they vote again, and then you can see there in the orange, Tennessee, North Carolina, Arkansas, they all followed Virginia. And Maryland was prepared to follow Virginia, and then some things happened. So let's look, before we go any further into the war aspect, kind of what goes on with the upper middle states, right? So remember, Missouri, the way I like to say it, 
has been at war already for five years. Now it was a, it was a very narrow war between Missouri and Kansas, but once Kansas had been brought in by the by the Congress as a union non-slave state, the tension between Missouri and Kansas did not end, but that allowed the government under Buchanan to send troops into Missouri. Um, they couldn't risk St. Louis, you know, somehow becoming problematic. They couldn't risk the Mississippi River. So even though there wasn't a war in 57, 58, 59, troops are, more troops from the Union had been moved into Missouri. So the governor, I like to think of Missouri as that, that we, on that last map, they should be painted orange because for all intents and purposes, the Missourians fought for the Confederacy. There, there probably were some Missourians who fought for the Union, but by and large, most troops fought for the Confederacy and the governor attempted to secede. He's not able to because the army forces are there and they're able to project force. This is one of the things about understanding a, a nation, which it may be interesting and a, a thing to pay attention to in our own time. A way that I've heard it said that I like to tell my students is, is that um, for a state to be effective, and I say state, I mean like a civic entity, anything that considers itself an independent place on a map without any allegiance to anybody else, anybody else necessarily, they have to have a monopoly on force. Meaning when push comes to shove, this, this, the government of that entity has to be able to have more force than any of its citizens. That's a mark of a state that is stable. And when you look through history at moments that were problematic for different places, and I'm talking about going all the way back to Rome, go back to, to Persia, when you see states, again, civic entities having problems, it is when some force within that region has gained enough leverage, enough power that it believes it can contend with the federal government, or whatever it may be. So the Union sends troops, or the government sends troops into Missouri. This prohibits the Missouri government from ever officially creating or seceding. But he does create basically government in exile. And again, most Missourians will fight. Delaware goes the opposite direction. Delaware had a very small uh, slave population, slave owners. And even those slave owners were resisting calls for any you know, desire. I mean, I'm sure there were a few who wanted to secede from the Union. But by and large, Delaware is like, yep, nope, we're not even voting on this. We're with the Union. Kentucky, as I already told you, declares themselves neutral, like we're staying out of it, which actually was good for the Union and bad for the Confederacy. Let me go back to this map just for a second so you can see it. You know, of course, the Ohio River, River is at the top here of Kentucky. Well, I'm not gonna expect most of you to have necessarily a background in military strategy, you know, in this kind of a thing. But in military terms, you want to always have very defensible borders. So the shoreline of the Atlantic Ocean, obviously that's great for the country. The Great Lakes is great for us and for Canada in that region. The Rio Grande River, it's kind of thin and shallow, so it's not quite as clear, but still it's a decent border for Mexico and the United States. And so if you're forming a new country, as they are, then you want a border you can protect. And from the north, the Ohio River would form a great border there in the center of your new country. With Kentucky proclaiming itself neutral, now you don't have that border. You just have a random line on the map separating Tennessee and Kentucky. Now, you could, if you're the Confederacy, kind of bank on the Union not being brave enough to invade Kentucky. And then you just sort of say, okay, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a border, but not a real border. And we'll just cross our fingers but you might lose out there. I mean, the Union might just roll over Kentucky, send troops across the river, and then you don't have a way to stop them. And if you know the Tennessee River area, there's a river here that, this is the Tennessee River, that kind of cuts down through Western Tennessee, Northern Alabama, and then back up through Eastern Tennessee. It's a beautiful river. I grew up in it, swam in it, all that stuff. Uh, but it's a horrible border if you're trying to defend the country, because it leaves Central Tennessee kind of exposed, it's just not a good deal. So having Kentucky proclaim its neutrality was really good for Lincoln. He's like, yes, great, beautiful idea. Make that happen. So he does. 
Maryland knows where the real challenge happens. As you know, Maryland and Virginia surround DC, the District of Columbia, and you may have caught this if you've paid attention to the musical Hamilton, or if you know your history, um, the District of Columbia was taken out of land from, a little bit from Virginia, more actually from Maryland, and just that square right there. For the Virginians, this was a mark of pride. This was a really big deal because they, they always project the country as being a greater Virginia. Early on in the country's history, they basically claimed land through almost all of North America, seeing it as, as a greater Virginia, right? And so having the capital right there was really important because for the founders, it was always important in this idea of keeping the government close. You could watch it, physically watch it. And so theoretically, if it's in Virginia, it's easy for, easier for them to get there than if it was in Philadelphia or if it was in New York, where it had been originally. Hamilton, when he makes this deal, is like it doesn't really matter where it is because that's not always where the power is going to lie. The power is also going to involve money. It's a different conversation. But Lincoln understands he can't lose Maryland because if he loses Maryland, he loses the capital. And kind of metaphorically and philosophically, it would look bad if the capital evacuated, the White House was built, the Capitol building did not have the rotunda. This was actually being built at this moment, but the Capitol building was there. If you give that to the Confederacy, you're going to give them projection. And I think it's fair right now, let me stop for just a second on Maryland to kind of just make this point. I will, for the rest of the time, be talking about the Confederacy as an existed nation, because for the four years that it exists, it is functioning as a nation. Now, historically, we know they lose. So this is an important point, and you'll see where I differ from Lincoln because Lincoln will spend the entire war trying to make the argument or making the argument that they're not a nation, they're just some people in rebellion, and then he'll eventually begin to convince himself of something that was fundamentally not true, which was most of the people or the majority of the people really want to be in the Union. It's just the small slaveholder elites that are the problem. That was fundamentally not true, but Lincoln would try to make this argument to himself and to anybody who'd listen because he was trying to say they are not a nation. So it's a, you know, it's a functioning aspect and you see it in our world today. So you may know in the nation of Spain, in the northeastern corner nearest the Pyrenees Mountains and the French border is the state of Catalan. Um, and so that state for the past, I wanna say now four years, has been striving to be independent. You may know over in the Balkans uh, near Serbia, is the region of, um, um, of Kosovo. It's a very small place. It would not be much larger, I don't think, than Central Florida, all of the three or four main counties in Central Florida. But for their purposes, they claim to be independent. You see this across the, the globe. You see this in various places. And of course, ultimately, what, what comes down to is what you can pull off, not just what you can talk. Now, in modern times, in Kosovo, you see it with the Palestinians in, in uh, the Middle East, you see it with Catalan. You know, they are appealing to the UN and to other people to say legally kind of make the other side do it, which is rarely going to be the case, right? So if Germany supports Catalan breaking away from Spain in the year 2020, then what will stop, you know, Bavaria from wanting to break away from Germany? See the problem there? So it's, you don't really see a lot of support. And this is why I think back now to the American Revolution, what was so important for Franklin and John Adams to be able to swing support in France. If they could get France to agree that we were our own nation and sign an, an alliance with us, then it was in essence, France standing up before the world saying, hey, that's a new nation we recognize. The recognition piece is a key kind of critical moment. And there's a lot that goes into it, right? Franklin was over there from the beginning almost, and France is like, yeah, we're not getting involved in this. We've just fought a century of war with England. We've lost most of those. We don't want to get in on this. They were waiting to see that we could prove something. Of course, what they wanted to see is win a major battle. And when we won the Battle of Saratoga in 77, okay. And then France jumps in, right? Adams had already gotten money from the Netherlands. So actually the first nation to support us was not France, but the Netherlands. 
And so John Adams gets us money. And so that helped us, right? But other nations don't get involved, mostly because they know that if they lose, they would be fighting against the parent nation, which in that case was England. So now bring it to here, right, to 1861. A lot of things go into whether or not you can gain the momentum with other nations to get their support. And if the capital is abandoned and this new nation sets up its capital in DC, just the, the kind of the pomp and circumstance and picture of the thing would be as if it certainly was the equal to the other nation, the parent nation of the United States. So Lincoln is desperate to keep Maryland in. And so as you can see there, this is problematic because once he calls for troops, he wants the troops to come down to DC, right? Well, to get to DC from the North, you're marching across the South. And in particular, the major railroad line from New England and Pennsylvania down came through Baltimore. Now Baltimore's not on this map, but it's just North up here, kind of there's the, the, the bay. Uh, Fort McHenry's on the North, they buried, they see the little corner of blue there. So it's just North up there. And so, the rail line came into Baltimore, then it shifted to a different rail line to go to DC. So in that moment, the troops or passengers would actually have to walk uh, uh, several blocks from one depot to another depot to change lines. And so when that happened, you can see in April, that led to a conflict. And on the second day of conflict, it, it could be described as an altercation that was equivalent to probably uh, Lexington and Concord, where you had troops opposing the, the armed troops of the legal government. Um, and so these guys probably did even consider themselves like the Minutemen, the heroes. And so now all of a sudden there's a problem for Lincoln. If they close off the route to DC, he's got no troops. And that's going to be a key issue along the way. Fortunately for Lincoln, in both days, the troops get through. They get to D.C., and then Lincoln and the governor of Maryland, who was leaning to secession, um, calls out the militia. That's a mixed bag because it's not certain that they're all, you know, pro-union. And so ultimately, over 61, and certainly in, in the June and July, more of the troops who were brought down from the initial call for volunteers actually end up stationed in Maryland so that they can hold the state in place. Now, all this time, Maryland leaders are demanding that there be a vote for secession. And this is the moment, we're gonna come back and spend a lot more time on this on another day, so not today, I'm just gonna mention it. Where you get to the first moment where Lincoln really crosses a line. I'm gonna say something pr provocative, so stay with me. Um, you can make an argument that Lincoln is the worst president in terms of how he treats the Constitution. Now, you all remember when 9-11 happened, and then you remember immediately after that, in 2002, uh, Congress passed the Patriot Act, and you then probably remember that there was a lot of negative pushback, and all the way up through President Obama's election, there was always this argument, in fact, it's still around today, there's some who still believe there are aspects of the Patriot Act that are egregious and overreaching on the Constitution. And of course, what's always at stake in America, unlike any other country in the world, is the sense of the individual independence relative to the role of the government. And it's, it'll often be discussed about rights or, or how much power the federal government has, but it's always this tension in our country um, that plays a role. And perhaps some would argue maybe it's played a role as to why maybe we haven't done as well um, confronting the pandemic, that there's no national strategy. Well, that's because historically, we don't like presidents or congresses giving us a national strategy for anything, quite honestly. Now, maybe World War II is the one exception to this thing. And so, in the process, Lincoln has most of the Maryland leaders who are kind of, you know, the leading citizens of the various cities, has them arrested. And then he doesn't charge them. Now, Again, we'll spend more time on this next time, but habeas corpus is an old English idea that was enfolded into our country, which is basically connected to the idea that you can't be arrested without the police telling you why. Like they think they have 48 hours 
in which they have to give you, they have to charge you to something or release you. They can't just keep you. And in the Middle Ages, you would be kept. You could be kept forever. And so one of the big victories from the Glorious Revolution in the 1680s was that habeas corpus was kind of enshrined in the English law. And so that became a foundation of our sense of our rights. And Lincoln just says, yeah, I'm not doing that. The Supreme Court will actually rule against him and demand he release the, these people and he won't do it. And so it's like one of these moments when you go, whoa, wait a minute. Now Lincoln's argument, of course, is I'm fighting a civil war and I just told you we can't give up the capital. So it's understandable, right? But at the same time, you kind of go, oh, wow. Okay, there's gonna be more of this. Or we're gonna spend more time with this with Lincoln. Ultimately, Maryland is held and it leaves us with this map. There's no change. Although again, metaphorically, I think you should paint Missouri kind of orange. And so now from here, well, where do we go? Well, we go to war, quite honestly. Now, when this happens, both sides begin setting up their armies and trying to figure out like, what are we gonna do? And it's interesting watching how they position each other. And if you go back and you read the papers of the time, particularly in the South, one of the things that you'll get a vibe from them is that they are casting themselves in the role of the American patriots. Now again, both will, you'll have different people kind of talking in terms of we're refighting the revolution and both North and South will make the argument that, yeah, we're the good guys. Nobody wants to be England in that story, right? But the South will be more specific. And this is why you get this term, the war of Northern aggression. Some of you who may have grown up in Southern cities and went to Southern you know, universities might have been taught this name for the Civil War. It's come back up again as, as we continue to have our churn about um, righting the wrongs from the failure of Reconstruction and that whole process. But, but long story short, when you see that term, it is the South's way of stating we're the revolutionaries who are trying to um, defend ourselves from an overpowered government, which again, if you remember when we talked about the American Revolution, that is the storyline that's laid. Now again, if you remember, I told you that's not actually accurate to the evidence. There's a lot more with the revolution and we talked about that in time and maybe in next year or so, maybe we'll go back to revolution. Just gotta love talking about it. It's worth looking at it again. Um, uh, there, there's a, the, the number one reason that we fought the American Revolution was not about taxes or representation or economics or land. It was about control. Who got to be in control? And I, I defended that, I think, pretty well when we talked about it. And there's more to say there. But in any case, in, this, in, the, myth, in the mythology of the country, and certainly in 1861, the mythology of the country was that we were minding our own business in 1770s. And evil England came and imposed themselves on us with a series of taxes and decisions about representation and decisions about land and they limited our expansion and they, they took our property and they were bad. They were just bad. And so in that process, then they're the bad guys and they were being aggressive. So the South spins a web right out the gate before even um, the secession happens. You can find papers in the South using phrases like I've got here for you. The tea is in the harbor. And so again, you get the picture, right? They're saying this is like 1774, 73. I mean, it's time to go. We, we're going to have to do this for the exact same reasons. Now, I find this really helpful in trying to understand what were the plans of these two countries? I mean, let me back up to this map just for a second. One thing that's fair to talk about is to kind of look and say, well, what were the odds for the South? And quite honestly, they're very long. They're very long. Um, uh, some more skilled and famous historians than myself will say things like the North was fighting with one hand tied behind its back. The North was fighting, and you'll find papers in 62 and 63 to where to some degree you can't tell that they're aware the war is going on because it's on some far distant land called Alabama. And, you know, I live in Wisconsin, never been there. And so it, there's a sense in which the North never really had to fully engage industrially or otherwise. It, it outnumbers the South to almost three to one. Um, in, industry wise, it, it's got 80, 85% of all the industry 
So the sales got a long, long road anyway to try to make it. And so they've got to figure out what do we do to kind of pull this off. And there is also a sense in which the South is already going to find itself cast in the role of defender because if nothing happens, so nobody marches anywhere, then by de facto, they still exist, no matter what Lincoln is saying, as a country. And so again, ultimately, you would win the kind of metaphorical discussion with a place like France or Germany or other places that would maybe show up and say, okay, we recognize you as a nation. So for that to be stopped, the North's gonna have to force them to stop. So again, kind of gives metaphor to that uh, idea of aggression. So I find it useful that they're both trying to talk about themselves as in the, within the revolution, because then you can look and see, well, how their battle plans kind of relate. And for me, and when I talk with my students, this is helpful. So let's backtrack. In 1776, this was the plan. The British had a threefold plan. The Americans had a threefold plan, basically. And in both cases, it's flawed. It, it's missing the mark on what needs to happen. And the winning side was going to be the side that figured that out. The North side, I mean, the British's idea was we'll isolate the rebellion. They thought it was just in New England and Virginia. It wasn't. It's part of their flaw. We'll use our Navy to kind of blockade and put economic pressure. And then we'll go and put our troops where the loyalists were, New York, the middle colonies, South Carolina, and that'll work out for us. The Americans, it was really all based on, again, playing defense. The longer we stay alive, the better it is for us. We need to win some battles, some key battles. And of course, with men like Washington, the desire is to fight a traditional battle for the time, and then again, earn the right to ask somebody like France to help us. That's the strategy. What they were missing in both cases was that the British never openly admitted we're fighting a civil war, because they were. We call it the American Revolution because we won. Had it been lost, it probably would be called its effective name, you know, the Fourth British Civil War. Britain's had four, and that would have been number four of civil wars right there, because um, British citizens were fighting British citizens. But they didn't want to go there, and one of the problems for the British Army when you study the American Revolutionary War is the fact that it was never clear to them, are we trying to kill our enemies, crush the other army like when we fought France, or are we trying to placate our citizens? If it's the latter, you want to do as little damage as possible. If it's the former, all bets are off, right? All's fair in love of war, right? Um, and so they never really got that right. Meanwhile, the Americans didn't realize that they never were going to have the power or the strength to defeat England because England's a superpower of the day. You're never going to win that battle, ever. Even if France helps you, France is not e England's equal. And even after we got the alliance in 77, by 1780, Washington was ready to just say, France, go your own way. France was annoyed with us. We were annoyed with France. It wasn't going well. So those three years with France didn't change the story that you're not going to be able to defeat the superpower fighting traditionally. You're going to have to cheat. You're going to have to fight exactly the way the forces in Iraq and Afghanistan have fought against us with cell phones and IDEs and, and, and secrecy and lies and you're merging and blending in with everybody else. The same thing we experienced in Vietnam, the same thing Russia experienced in Afghanistan, the same thing every, uh, um, s the main power has faced in any guerrilla warfare. You don't know who the enemy is. And that's to the advantage of the guerrilla warfare fighters. And the whole point is you're trying to make the other side quit like we did in Vietnam. And like we made what Britain do here, remember from Carl's way of saying that we didn't win the American Revolution, England quit and they were smart to do so. There's no way unless they're going to kill all 2 million British citizens that they're going to find a way to placate everybody. And the longer they're there, the more farms they burn down, the more angry they're going to make everybody. So now keep this in mind when you look at what we decided for us. So Lincoln's strategy well, Winfield Scott, who we mentioned briefly in the Mexican War, we did it a lot more when we talked last year about the Manifest Destiny, two Mexican War series that we looked at. Winfield Scott was a, a war hero. He was older at this point, and he came up with a plan that basically mimics the British. We would split the Confederacy into pieces. We would use the Navy to blockade the coast and put economic pressure on the Confederacy. 
And then we would try to figure out where the few places of loyal support were and kind of springboard from there. That's the strategy. You can see it kind of depicted on the map here. Some problems with that strategy, particularly with the naval part, we only had about 40 ships when the war began. You can't blockade Daytona to Jacksonville effectively with 40 ships. So they were gonna to try to go from Virginia to Texas. So you can imagine one of the things the North will do immediately is launch into a massive naval building campaign. And by 1865, we'll have the third largest Navy in the world. This is one of the reasons why America's own imperialism period in the 1870s and 1900s picks up at this moment. What was the Confederacy plan? Same thing as the, as the Americans in 1776. Stay alive, win some key battles, try to get support from other countries. Um, they actually believed in large measure the North would not fight. The Lincoln would ask for armies, but they're not gonna fight. And they thought that for two reasons. One, because as we've said two or three sessions ago, the North had very little support for abolition. So they weren't you know, pro, pro ending of slavery. So that's not gonna get their help. And most of the North would have been a pro states rights point of view. That the, we don't want a federal government. We don't wanna see you know, an overreaching federal government. And so the South assumed that nobody would fight for them. They were wrong because Lincoln and the PR of the Northern press will at least initially do a very good job at kind of spinning the story to be that, hey, look, the country's been attacked. And for most countries, when a war happens, there is at least an initial enthusiasm that's often called the rally around the flag phenomenon that brings high support to the country, to the president or to the leader if it's another country and they don't have a president and people volunteering to fight. So the idea that the North would not prosecute the war was a flawed idea from the Confederacy. And then one maybe unique function, although the American rebels did this in 74, 75, 73, before the fighting starts, was use economic pressure. In the American Revolution, they were trying to convince the British merchants that they would lose on these markets. Here, of course, cotton is king, and as I think we mentioned on the journey in, the Industrial Revolution had happened and cotton was with the textile industry, making clothes out of cotton was one of the, was the, perhaps the dominant um, industry of the early Industrial Revolution. So because of that, they thought we can hold our cotton and this will put pressure on those merchants to recognize us. That was a flawed plan too, because what England basically did is said, well, where else can we grow cotton? And they realized cotton would grow really well in places like Egypt. And so Egypt was owned, controlled by England at that point. So that was gonna work out for them. But both the North and the South, their battle plans, again, my, my thought, are flawed. How are they flawed? Well, the North, at, at least initially, has no strategy, just like the British, of crushing the enemy. Now Lincoln, to his credit, will figure this out. So after the, the ruinous battle of Fredericksburg in December of 62, it was a terrible defeat for the Union. Lincoln realized, and, and the general that he had, General Burnside, retreats, comes back, just like they almost all did in this first three years of war. They'll fight Lee, they'll fight in the South, they'll lose, they'll retreat. They, they'll, it, we'll get into it. And Lincoln says in a letter, no general yet found can face the arithmetic, but the end of the war will be at hand when he should be discovered. Now, what's he saying there? He's saying, I recognize we're going to have to go in and basically destroy at least the enemy army. And even if they're winning the battles and killing three of us for the one of them, there's more of us than there are of them. So doing the arithmetic, we can take the ruinous losses like Fredericksburg if we have to, and we'll still win overall as long as I can find a general who can face that music. Because it's brutal, right? Nobody wants to be the leader who has people dying because of decisions you made. And that's, that's, you know, horrible, right? And that's one of the challenges for military leaders is that you send people into battle and you're not typically there with them and then they suffer, they die in these battles. 
And so, you know, if you lose, and losing is usually a, a very loose term, either it's a t concept of how many people were killed, or it's a concept of the land, like who, who controlled the land? Did we take the city or not take the city? Did we get to the Ohio River and hold it, or did we not get there? You know, that kind of thing is winning and losing. And so Lincoln's saying, look, we can lose more men than them, but we'll win because there's more of us. And he was right. And so he's got to find that general. The South has the same problem the Americans had. They're trying to fight formal battles against the superpower. Now, the Union in the North is not a superpower in world terms, but if you're going to put these two on a scale and kind of weigh it out, if you were picking a side to play in a video game, you'd pick the Union every time because the overwhelming strength in numbers and money and industry and technology lay in the North, not the South. And so the idea that they could fight kind of mano a mano, that's a flawed idea. And in particular, waiting, just being on the defense and just letting them attack you, not good. If you ever played chess, you know white goes first. And one of the challenges is you would prefer to get the initiative. The initiative, you see this in sports all the time. Who makes the first move? Who can spin it? You know, who can get the momentum? And in chess, black is always on the receiving end, but you're always waiting to see if there's a moment when white makes a move that you don't have to counter, and you can make another move and then make white counter your moves. You get the momentum. And you can see, just I use Lee as one example, he was not the only one, but they're saying, hey, look, we should just relax. And we'll see in a moment after the Battle of Bull Run, this is an example of where they don't follow up their victory with momentum. They go, we'll just wait because we're assuming the North will just give in and or other countries will recognize us. So these mistakes are gonna be really, really big in the process. Eventually, for the, for the North, they'll find Grant, and we'll pick that up later as we get going, and Grant will be that general for Lincoln who can do the math. And in the South, as they get close to the election year, only then, and it's really basically after they lose at Gettysburg, does the South think our only hope is to try to make the war miserable for the North so that they either A, get rid of Lincoln, or B, quit fighting. And so that's, that's kind of their gamble at that point. For them, it's too little, too late. They don't realize what needs to happen. And for the Americans, they were able to, in, in 1776, we could pull off our change in our battle plans before the British really made any change in their battle plans. So there we go. There's your strategies. There's your plans. Now, who's working that out are obviously the men, and in some cases, women, who are fighting in this war. Now, the United States Army in that moment is very small. Remember, the Mexican War had happened. that had a fairly decent-sized army. They all left. Men like Grant, um, you know, basically left the army and all across the country. And the soldiers were volunteers. It's always been a volunteer army that goes back to some of our beliefs philosophically um, about what a country should be. And the idea of a citizen militia is that you don't want a standing army, no standing army kind of a thing. That was true in the South. But remember, we talked about this after Harper's Ferry, the Southern states became more worried about Northern invasion. So they really started more seriously training. Now their soldiers were not greatly more experienced but they had a little bit of a, of a leverage on it. The Civil War certainly hits West Point. Depending on who you read, you will see claims that the majority of Civil War leaders from West Point went to Confederacy. I'm not convinced that's accurate. And, and I, I look today again, reviewing some notes and some, some statistics. In general terms, only about 30 to maybe 40% Again, I put 35 to 50 just to honor the other, the other historians who think differently, um, can, you know, left. I think some of why people feel this way is because you may know this, overall, when you compare the journey of the war from 61 through 65, it does feel fair to say that the Confederacy had the better generals, that their generals did a better job. Um, compared to, particularly in Virginia's area, so many rotation generals that Lincoln goes through replacing people because they basically give up. Again, I'm not sure that's exactly fair that the best officers went to the South. 
and because there's some amazing officers and obviously we're talking literally about hundreds of officers all the way down to second lieutenants so you got a lot of people and we think of lee or we think of grant or we think of jackson and people like that and 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 you know i think we're going to miss the boat but it is fair to say that a percentage and a healthy percentage of the officer corps leaves to come south so that weakens or opens the door for weakness in the north all right um, Lee is the most famous one, as we know, from current day. And I just mentioned that um, he was held in high esteem in the North, not, not so much in the South, not initially, as we'll see in just a second. So in the North, he's offered commission, basically commander in chief of, um, of the army. Scott would have been still on as the number one, and Lee would have been like the lead general. And Lee's like, I cannot take up my sword against my native soil. And so when Virginia secedes, he goes with them. But when he does, he's not actually put in charge. In fact, he becomes an advisor for Jefferson Davis. Davis, it's a lot of criticism. I don't know that it's fair, but you may remember when we talked about the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, he was Secretary of War. So he's a West Point uh, graduate. I, don't, I think he did fight in the Mexican War, but he, he was well uh, admired as a military strategist someone who can look at the map and kind of figure out who needs to go where and how do we move troops and supply and kind of the larger picture. As the president of the Confederacy, he technically should have turned that over to a general staff, but he doesn't. And this is another one of those moments when we kind of start seeing the flaw of the, of kind of the, the, Confederates, the Confederate concept. If you're going to say states' rights, then you can't really have an organizing general staff, and they won't. And that will mean then throughout the totality of the war, there's kind of an ongoing conflict as different generals, including Lee, will think of themselves as more, I'm my own commander in this area of the map. And even though I'm part of that country and there's another area of the map, that's not my problem. And that's not effective for fighting a war. And so this will, this will show up as we go through the process. The first place it shows up is not Bull Run, though. In both East Tennessee and Western Virginia, the vote total was so high pro-union that leaders in those area wanted to secede, wanted to, to basically break off in some capacity and join or stay within the union in some way. In both cases, it would be military and armies who make the decision. Now, obviously, West Virginia or Western Virginia, as you can see, is close enough to the north that Lincoln was able to move troops in relatively quickly. So he does, and as you can see from June all the way through the fall, but certainly those first battles in June and July were really important. And this is actually where Lee will get his first action. Lee's not at Bull Run. Most people are like, what, Lee wasn't at Bull Run? Nope, he's not at Bull Run. He was in Western Virginia trying to hold on to that land. He was not the original commander. Again, he initially was an advisor to Davis which is, you know, again, interesting considering that the Union was, the North was prepared to put Lee in charge of things. It doesn't go well for the Confederate troops. And so this will allow the Western leaders to kind of press on their, on their journey. In East Tennessee, though, where I'm from, the opposite happens. It's not close to the North, but Davis is able to move troops in. And so from Western North Carolina, the mountains of Georgia and Alabama, Troops were moved into East Tennessee between Chattanooga and Knoxville, all the way up to the top, to the upper East Tennessee part, um, and basically stationed. Um, union leaders, um, men and some families were arrested or they fled for their lives. And again, this is interesting when you see this, when you think, wait, I thought the South was all about states' rights. Well, if you were, you would have said, hey, if they want to secede, let them secede, not my problem, right? They, at the same moment that Southern leaders and Southern papers were blistering Lincoln about Maryland and, and breaking habeas corpus, to some degree they were doing the exact same thing in East Tennessee. And this is why so many of my relatives and my family and friends' relatives all fought for the Union. Um, when I grew up, there certainly were little boys running around with Confederate flags and we'd, you know, play Army in the and, and, you know, little kids in second, third, fourth grade, and, and most of us wanted to be in the Union and not the Confederacy um, because um, we, we all had all grown up in East Tennessee, which stayed relatively Union uh, throughout the war. In the end, 
Western leaders will successfully appeal to Congress to become its own state. They initially were going to try to call it Kanawha, which back on this map you can see over here, this river right here. This is one of the major rivers. It's a Native American term right here in Western Virginia. I think they decided that was just too hard to say, so they just went with West Virginia. So West Virginia emerges as a state at this moment, which we'll come back to this on another day. It's really a problematic issue for Lincoln to accept West Virginia. So where does this lead us? Well, this leads us to the first major battle, and it's going to be in Virginia proper. This is because both countries, both militaries, both presidents, everybody sort of saw this as this will be a short, simple thing. It'll be a quick little deal. Once we take their capital, which for both cases, I mean, they're 90 miles apart, D.C. and Richmond, it's going to be simple to get there. The other side, they won't fight or they won't fight well. And so the clash will occur right outside of D.C. Now, let me just say here on the outside of, of what will be, you know, seven or eight sessions that we'll go through on these wars, we have done an amazing job as a nation preserving these battlefields. And I hope that you have had a chance to visit them. And if you feel up to it and the coronavirus ever ends, maybe you get a chance if you have it. They're wonderful to visit. Um, I've been to several, not to all, and Manassas is a good one. And you'll also know, just to say quickly, if you pay attention and you've studied the Civil War at all, that there are several battles in which two names are given. So if you study the Civil War from the South or look at a Southern textbook, you'll see this is often known as the First Battle of Manassas. And then there'll be a second battle of Manassas. Uh, the Union, of course, called it Bull Run. Bull Run was the name of the river that was near Manassas, still there today, uh, the Bull Run. And um, different people will give you reasons why. Um, there's not really a great reason why that, that anybody's ever really proclaimed, but still, that's the way it kind of walks down. Leading the armies for the South is our good friend Beauregard, who we've already met. He's the guy who led the fighting at uh, in, down in South Carolina at Fort Sumter. For the North, the first there will be a series of leaders for the Union Army nearest the capital, uh, Irvin McDowell. McDowell has a little bit of an advantage, 28,000 to 22,000. Usually I'm just going to give you round numbers. I'm not going to try to get to the too specific. Nearby are two other armies. Uh, Johnson over here in the top corner, you can see, you can actually think of that as being closer to the issues in Western Virginia. He's not really on the map to necessarily help Beauregard. He's just sort of in that process of what's happening with Union forces coming into Western Virginia. And so he's there in Winchester. McDowell's plan was to march from DC down towards Beauregard, get close to Manassas, and basically loop around him and try to envelop him and kind of capture him. What he doesn't know, and what will be interesting if you really want to study this, is this U.S. Civil War is a fascinating study of spy stuff. So if you like CIA, KGB, spies, you know, kind of, you know, James Bond kind of hidden in the background, not the guys up there always necessarily fighting, 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 but just the secret spy stuff, the Civil War is fascinating. And again, because of the location between, you know, Eastern Virginia and D.C. and the relationships that many of the people had from a social point of view, there is a whole network of information that both nations will utilize. Beauregard finds out what McDowell's plans are. He sends word to Johnson and he gives Johnson, look, we need you to come over. And so you're going to have to try to figure out a way to sneak away so Patterson doesn't know you're coming and make your way over to Manassas. Otherwise, we're outnumbered. Now, this map showing him McDowell with 35,000, he doesn't bring all those. So he brings about 28,000 troops with him on his way down. And he marches down, and this, again, here's a strategy. He's gonna kind of make what seems to be an attack down to the center of the map there, but then he's gonna loop over to the left. So it kind of, it's gonna come this way, over this way, and try to come around the river. Virginia's got several wonderful rivers in it, which the Confederacy will use as part of their defensive lines throughout the strategy of the war. So that's his plan. The problem for both armies is the fact that, as we already said, both, both of the soldiering groups are inexperienced. They, they just hadn't done it. Um, anybody who's been in the military, I have not, can tell you that there's all kinds of marching orders and things that you have to go through and there's ways to, that they call out cadences, ways to know when to do what. And the more experienced the unit becomes, the better it becomes at this. 
Both were inexperienced. In fact, uh, one uh, group of historians took some of the Confederate orders from Bull Run and put it into a computer so they could say if they had done what they were told to do, what would have happened? And they ultimately would have been shooting at each other, at themselves. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a chaotic scene. It's kind of uncertain what's happening. Initially, the, the Union Army does well, and they're able to push these guys back to this place here. But what McDowell never learns until too late is that Johnson has already made it to the battlefield, and he's marching from Manassas City and up towards the battle, and you see that on the map there. Ultimately, Johnson's arrival will give Beauregard the advantage militarily. Now, it's slight. And when you study military battles, and again, I'm not trying to bore you with too much tactics, it's always a mathematical equation that you're looking for. Like, how many one-to-one -one do you have? This would be what we would call a one-to-one -one battle, like 28,000 to 31,000. It's a little bit of an advantage for the Confederacy, not significant. And you're looking to see if you can bring more troops to the battle than your enemy. If you can get two-to-one, that's great. Three-to-one, that's amazing. That's what you really want. So a one-to-one -one battle is kind of a dicey thing. It's going to go back and forth and back and forth. After the initial success of the Union Army pressing forward, the Confederacy basically builds a second line on this line here, Henry House Hill. And in the middle of it is a, not too young, but an unknown general leading a group of Virginians, many from the Virginia Military Institute, and he's standing on the hill. And while others are retreating, he's, his group's standing still. That is Thomas Jackson. Now, in the battle, somebody cries out trying to get the other soldiers who are retreating to stop and turn around and reform. He goes, stop, man, stop. Hold the line. Look, stand with the Virginians. They're standing like a stone wall. Now, to this day, we don't know exactly what was meant. Um, was Jackson up there defending his post like a stone wall, or was he basically preparing for the advance and not doing anything all that amazing? Doesn't matter, he gets the nickname, and from there, he'll be known as Stonewall Jackson, and his brigade becomes known as the Stonewall Brigade, and it becomes one of the most famous units in the war, and in fact, probably in American history. Highly decorated, and there was a sense of, boy, if you were in the Stonewall Brigade, boy, you were something, you were, you were special. And ultimately, the Confederacy, forming around Jackson and other units, will hold and then with a few more numbers than, again, McDowell understood, they counterattacked on a flank. And the inexperienced Union Army, upon seeing this counterattack, broke and ran. And they ran, as you can see here, up the turnpike, through Centerville, and basically back to D.C. Now, there's a whole bunch more with Bull Run that we could talk about. Um, I, one of the things that happens that's just sort of amazing and curious, but tells you the tenor of the people, is that people from miles around, from D.C., from Richmond, they rode up to the battlefield like they're watching a football game. They brought picnic lunches. They brought their kids. I mean, they're kind of, this is exciting. This will be the only battle of the Civil War. We want to see this thing. And, of course, what they saw was that war is hell. It's horrific. Men, mangled bodies, deadly, bloodly. It was so much bloodier than anybody had expected. When it was all over, as you can see there on the map, over 4,500, 4,700 people um, were casualties. Now, when you see the word casualty in military, that's talking about killed, wounded, or missing, right? So that, they always risk not how many people were killed. We'll talk about that later when we get to Antietam. But just so you can recognize, in case you think 4,700 is not a big deal, in the Battle of Iwo Jima, which you may remember from World War II, it's considered the bloodiest battle for the U.S. Marines. In all of World War II, the Marines had one-third of all their casualties at the Battle of Iwo Jima. I mean, it's a horrific battle in World War II. It lasted for 36 days. Over 26,000 U.S. men are, are part of the casualties, killed, wounded, missing, right? But if you divide that by the days, it's 722 a day compared to 4,700 a year. Or if you want to, it's about 30 an hour. Now, anybody lost for life on Iwo Jima, that's tragic, right? That's tragic. I'm not trying to say one's better than the other. But I want you to get a sense of the 4,700 in that eight hours of fighting was a tremendously large number. I mean, it was, it was shocking. Everybody was stunned, um, both then at the day in immediate aftermath, and then for months to come. There's really no more battles in all of 61 to speak of. 
because there was a sense to which both sides, I think, were sobered to go, wait a minute, what have we done? Or, what are we in? How serious are we going to do this? Now, they don't back down either side, but there is a sense in which, wow, this will not be a quick war. It was so shocking to everyone of how bloody the war was on this one day. And of course, if you know anything about the Civil War, this one battle will ultimately just become insignificant. If you're ranking the battles from a sense of loss and death, I mean, it's, it's a minor skirmish. Almost. We really only talk about Bull Run because it was the first major battle, but also because it gives us Stonewall Jackson and it shows us how brutal the war is going to be. When now, once it's over, everybody steps back to try to assess, well, what, what does this mean? McDowell gets blamed, he gets fired. This will be a repeatable pattern, unfortunately, for the Union. They never are willing to let a general kind of stay in the saddle to get fixed. It also begins the process for the general staff, not for the soldiers of the Union Army, to kind of get fragile. It's like Lee and the, the Confederate leaders like Stonewall Jackson and eventually Lee begin to take on such a kind of a, a mythic, a mythic view that the Union leaders struggle. They will replace McDowell with George McClellan, who, as we will see in a couple of weeks, will become one of the most controversial leaders of the Union Army. He was a great organizer. I've always said he'd have been amazing, a quartermaster, and he'd been given that role. Um, but he was terrible on the battlefield, a terrible strategic and tactical general, and he didn't like to fight. His troops loved him. He fed them, he marched them, he trained them. Remember, they were untrained. After, McDow after McClellan got through with them, by 62, they were a very well-trained army. So that was good. But it's kind of like the guy who buys a really fancy car and then never wants to drive it because it might get dirty. You know, is that kind of a guy? For the South, we see this problem with the leadership, right? Davis and Beauregard don't like each other. They have a history from the back, from the, from the back years. And again, Davis believed he knew best and Beauregard was not afraid to say, hey, you know, you're the president. You're not supposed to have anything to do with this. Stay out of it. So they're going to clash. And so their armies will be combined. Joe Johnson will be left in command, and Beauregard will be shipped to the west. He'll go off to Mississippi, which we'll find him next week in the next major battle that we talk about. The Confederacy does not follow up the, the success, as I mentioned before. And for many people, this was kind of evidence of the fact of they did not take their moment. Just like the British in New York, after they crushed Washington in two or three battles in a row, they never go in for the kill and really go in and do what they could have done. And here the Confederacy possibly could have followed up. At this point, DC is not well fortified. So it would have been interesting to see what would have happened. But of course, there were more troops, as I already told you, in Maryland and some in DC itself. So, so you know, they, I don't know that they could have taken DC. But with the Union Army collapsing and routing, had they pursued them, they might have at that moment. One more slide. So what happens for the rest of the year? Well, the rest of the year, there's no major battles. There's issues in Missouri, which go all the way through the year. I already told you about Lee in West Virginia, so that's happening. I already mentioned to you the Confederacy invades Kentucky. That happens in the fall in September. There's battles in Missouri, one involving Grant, only mentioned this battle for Grant. It's really a tiny little battle. It's not significant, but it's important because it's Grant, and we're going to know Grant's going to become our lead general, so kind of following his career a little bit. McClellan is made commander-in-chief of the whole army. This is not good for McClellan. He, had, he got the big head really quickly and starts making some kind of crazy talk. And then in November, there's a diplomatic blow-up involving England. Um, it almost gives the South exactly what they want. Fortunately, Lincoln and John Adams' great-great-grandson, or great-grandson, I think it's his great-great-grandson, Charles, is the diplomat in London. And he's able to kind of stall them off as Lincoln works to kind of extricate them from this problem. They, the blockade had captured a ship. Two diplomats were on there. Technically, in war, you don't capture diplomats. They're kind of have diplomatic immunity and you let them go, they weren't let go. Lincoln eventually lets them go. That would have been a problem, obviously. So we come to the end of the year. There's another slide I was gonna show you, but I'll just say we'll start there next time. So what we can see is the war started, 61 is not a significant year relative to the war. Some battles were fought in Missouri and in Virginia, 
Western Virginia, and then obviously Bull Run's the first significant battle. And the big takeaway is neither side's backing down. And so this is really going to ramp up into a real full-fledged war. And it's going to take some serious maneuvering, some serious planning. And it's going to take a while um, before they pull this off. Eventually, Lee will be rescued from his kind of disgrace in West Virginia, and he'll become our leader. And remember, what's the South looking for? They're looking for help. If the one thing they can get is just like the Americans in 77, if they can get help from England or France, that could work out to their advantage. But they're going to have to find their own Saratoga to pull that off. And so eventually, Lee will figure this out and go looking for his Saratoga. So we'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us again, and we'll pick it up in 62, and we'll see what McClellan does, and we'll go out west, and we'll find really our first, our first major battle happening in the western part of Tennessee, and maybe you've been there, it involves our boy Grant. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I hope you guys are well, and we will see each other hopefully in person sooner rather than later, but definitely next Thursday right here with you guys. All right, see you. Bye-bye.